Welcome to Neutral Exposure, a space for reflection and inspiration with photographers across a range of disciplines. My name's Al Simmons. This episode's with portrait photographer Richard Anser. I hope you enjoy. And a huge amount of, of what I do is, is based on a vast archive of, of, um, of probably 25 years of constantly shooting. Okay. And I don't tend to work terribly well in the present. So um, I tend to shoot in the present, but I may not always understand what I'm doing. So a lot of my stuff is I'm going back into the archive anyway to see what the hell I was doing. Right. You know, a year ago or six months ago or, or anything. So I suppose at the moment I'm looking at a lot of work that was shot within the last six months, which I'm sort of deeply happy with, but haven't really had a chance to really engage with and see what I was doing. So one of the projects I'm looking at is the women's prison project, which I probably shot a year ago, but then I couldn't show for six months because it was embargoed. And then I could show it. And now I'm finally looking at it and seeing if there's anything valuable for me there. Okay. Anything personal. Because a lot of the, a lot of the commission work I get is very close to being very personal work. So my commissioners tend to throw me bones that, do really suit what I do. Mm. Yeah, there just seem um, to be a, a blend between the personal pursuits and the, and, the, and the projects that you're commissioned on. Yeah, I'm really lucky like that. I think mm. part of the risk was, if quite a few years ago, I took the risk of stop, stopping doing the commercial work, which was sort of generic. Um, and I said no to certain stuff and became very specifically portrait based. And then also I kind of came out a lot of my work that a lot of my best work and the work I love most, I wasn't showing because it felt like it conflicted. Um, it felt like it conflicted with making a lot of money. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I just reached a point in my career where I just thought I should start showing that work and seeing if anybody wanted to use me for that. But sure. it's quite edgy. Um, some of it I don't I'm saying that and it's not really for me to say I don't I know think if it's you fair to it. say yeah yeah I yeah. think it's quite raw yeah it is it's quite yeah there's a rawness to it and it's like well will, you, will anybody want that so it, it, it was a risk and I suppose now I'm very much getting specific project work um, which is being offered and I'm I'm not taking but I'm also not even being offered that work because my my clients who've known me a long time actually and mm. worked with me for many years know what what uh, they think is best uh, to give me. A new client um, is, is a bit trickier. Yeah. It's very difficult to enter a, for me to enter a, a new relationship with somebody when they say, oh, can you photograph? I don't know. It could be anything, any portrait. And they look at the work online and they go, oh, that might not be what we're looking for. But mm -hmm. the, the idea of, I suppose, having a style uh, that, 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 that's distinctive, at least when someone does come to you, they... Um, it's quickly answered whether you can do it, whether you're suitable or not. Yeah, yeah. And it is really, I mean, it's sort of self-editing, self really. It's not like I'm saying no to people. It's just mm. that it's pretty clear what you're getting. Technically, it's very clear. There's a very, there's a rawness to the lighting. I'm not pretending I'm not in the room with my subjects. No, it's that's... very obviously this blast of flash on, on somebody. Mm. And it's very clear that there's a photographer standing in front of the subject. I'm not. I get very excited by that. It's not even, it's, it's a very visceral response. I love lighting like that. And that's why I do it. So mm. I think I could, could be more successful if I, if I was a little bit more subtle. I, I sure. I, how, how, how do you describe your work? Because you've said there that it's portrait photography, but I would, I would say that there's definitely a, an, an, another dimension to it. Yeah, well, it, it, portrait, I call it portrait photography, a portrait, I call myself a portrait photographer ostensibly because it requires a relationship. There's a contract between my subjects. I'm not doing pictures without people's permission. And I think permission, certainly with my subjects, is hugely important. So it's a form of collaboration. So it is a fine art practice, but it's portraiture in, in, in the purest, most traditional sense of the word. It is a relationship between me and the sitter. And therefore, in the fine art element of it, is that it acknowledges my presence in the room with that person and my influence on that relationship. Yeah, and yeah. that is what my work's about. It's an existential practice where I'm acknowledging the power of the photographer to influence everything. Well, I, like, I, like to, I like to quote from your, uh, your, your, your statement on your website, which said it's photography about the existential chaos of human existence. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And that's, um, that's, both, that's both the subject and, and you as the photographer, I, I guess yeah. that's quite clear. Yeah, you're throwing, you're throwing that in, into the mix. You're throwing yourself into the mix with someone and seeing what comes out. There are dogmatic boundaries that I frame that. And if you look at the work, it's very much uh, within a space that's... Um, boundary so i kind of create a space 
within which a chaos of a, per, of a human relationship can occur. Because I'm not very, um, I'm a very challenging personality. I, I can't help but um, nudge you in the ribs. Mm. And I don't, do it, uh, I don't do it deliberately. So when, you, when you're in a room with me, the relationship and the, the picture and the response that the camera is getting is very much a direct response to someone reacting to me saying something that is potentially uh, challenging, but the camera can't read it. The yeah, camera yeah. just reads the response. So I would say that my, my work is very much about the flash as well. It is very important. Like the style of, the reason why I use flash is because it, it's the only real way. You can't do it with daylight. It, the only way to, to it absolutely freeze, freezes a, an emotional moment in mm -hmm. such a minute millisecond. Mm -hmm. that you can't, that it, it's identifying a, a singular emotion in that moment. It can be really complex. And actually what, I, what I'm always looking for, whether, it, whether I'm successful or not, is an ambivalent emotion that doesn't quite make sense. So in my edit, I'll probably choose a picture which is uh, may not entirely read as an emotion that is is simply defined. Mm, I see. Yeah. So I'd rather it ask the question. Yeah. So um, of, of what that person's experiencing. Often it's 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 more playful than anything else. I'm not particularly interested in in representing the truth of someone's life at all. So in in, in the sense of that, it's not a conventional practice either, even though it's a, it's a traditional approach. Not really. It sounds it sounds incredibly uh, narcissistic or even unkind, but I don't. I'm not conceptually interested in the person. I don't yeah. think photography can capture yeah. the, well, I was, the entirety I was, of a human being in a moment. Yeah. Well, I, was, I, I was going to ask this because quite often portrait photography or documentary photography, the, the attention or the focus or the, the way in which a photographer describes it is always very much related to the subject. You know, it's telling the story of a subject and very rarely the photographer gets brought into that equation, mm -hmm. whereas you very much bring yourself into that. And yeah. I'd be quite interested to hear your thoughts on kind of what you're trying to illuminate with that. Well, I, I disagree with the premise of that because actually you say most photographers um, are telling a story about someone else's life. My argument is that they're not. They mm. think they are, but they're not. A photograph is a document of someone else's relationship to that person as mm. much as it is about recording the person. I'm, I think the photography, I think photography is much more of a, an indication of the, the, the photographers, uh, where the photographer is in their relationship to the world. And I think it is disingenuous to be polite, to present work as some sort of truthful narrative. Um, so my work is a form of critique of that, but also it, it's an acceptance. It's an acceptance that, I mean, I wouldn't do documentary work because inherently in a, in a, in a fine art context, I mean, I'm not disrespecting documentary, but in a fine art context, it's not recognizing, it's presenting something as a truthful narrative, as a conventional truthful narrative. I would say that I am interested, very interested in people and mm. human beings, but I just don't think photography necessarily, going back to what I said before, can capture the essence of a person's, a single person's life in a mm. still moment. But the, I am interested in capturing the vulnerability of a person in those first few moments when they step into my frame, okay. because I think that is a universal shared experience that people can feel mm. it's a form of trying to create pictures that empathize with other people's experience so um my audience which might be a little esoteric and a little small um the people that seem to respond to it um for instance if you have a mental health problem you might recognize um the vulnerability of a subject in that moment rather than the confidence so i have no interest in I have absolutely no interest in producing images which intimidate people by their beauty, uh, by their conventional beauty or by their, by their confidence. So if I'm asked to photograph a celebrity, for instance, like Vanity Fair employed me, God knows why, for about four years to photograph all these famous people because the, art, the, the creative director just really liked this odd version of celebrity that, that seemed to be coming out. Okay. Um, because I wasn't... It wasn't, it, you could call it iconoclasm, uh, but iconoclasm it implies something cynical, but it's not. It's about removing the celebrity element and, and exposing the humanity of a person who happens to be very famous. It's extremely unfashionable to do it. Yeah, yeah, and difficult, I no, imagine. Nobody's interested in it. And um, 
and certainly not the PRs of the pe the famous people who you were photographing don't want you to do it. Yeah. Um, I'm old enough to remember when I had a lot more freedom to photograph uh, um, somebody quite famous. They just send me off and go and do it and see what comes back. And I think a lot of photographers of certain era um, mm. will remember that. Whereas now a lot of celebrity shoots, even some great photographers like Nadav Kander, you can see him working with Trump, for instance. That's a very interesting video mm. of Nadav Kander working with Trump. There are so many people in the room and it's incredibly controlled. Even, even Kander can't find a way to produce something humane and valuable out of that it seems mm, so mm. controlled and, and i think it is hard to and even when i do capture something interesting i, I did a picture of hillary mantel and it's a beautiful picture of a swirling in this cape and it's lovely but you know as i say the client can choose not to use those and use something which more conventionally represents a person but um i i do love the idea of humanizing someone uh, and, and removing that uh, persona getting mm -hmm. through that persona of someone who's built up a very complex persona sure do, do you need a fa uh, quite amount of time to be able to break through that that barrier no, because i mean no, no. the less time the better right i mean uh, usually if someone steps into your frame of reference that's when they're at their most vulnerable so um for instance if i'm in a studio or something i'll the, the assistants will uh, back me up i'm sure on this but they're brief not to not to respond in any way to the subject if they Humor, for instance, is, 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 is completely unacknowledged in, okay. um, and stuff like that. So there'll be a moment where I, I will go, I will not respond in a way that makes the, 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 um, the subject feel immediately comfortable. So it's, that's very opposite to the way a lot of photographers will probably work, who work very hard to make people feel comfortable. But I'm more interested in them stepping into a space and then wondering what that feels like, feels like for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I'm just, I'm, I'm just thinking about some of the... the, the the non-celebrity projects that you've worked on yeah which is where i'm most you know that is it's more it's more than vulnerable but, you know it's bare and it's raw yeah you know, how do you break well, through that barrier well, that's what's interesting that's why i say it's portraiture because a lot of people will look at my series of fat people or people who are self-harming at the moment which i'm doing a lot of mm. and the first question is well you know how did you do that and mm. it's like clearly there's a relationship there it's not machiavellian there is a there's a conversation to be had with somebody especially with someone with mental health problems um, I have a huge amount of experience in dealing with people with traumatic health, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mental health problems. So I'm extremely cautious about my approach to those people. Mm. But um, it's... Does it take uh, a long time before you bring the camera into the equation? No. No. No, uh, it doesn't. It's, it's, I think you, if, you, if you have... If you um, say the right things to somebody then they are reassured very quickly because they know that you're somebody that they that understands or at least empathizes with mm. what they're going through. Mm. So um, I guess you'd have to ask someone else why they do, why they choose to expose themselves yeah, yeah, yeah. in the way that they might expose themselves to me. But um, I'm quite transparent about what I'm doing, but they are, I suppose there is an element of, they are complicit, but they're not fully collaborating because nobody fully understands the motives behind what I'm doing, um, apart from me. And also, sometimes the context, which is which upsets the, which can upset the fine art community a bit, is sometimes I move the context, the narrative, and I do clearly state that in my statement. But sometimes I'll potentially be working on something with with a clear narrative, um, but then move it out of that narrative and then present it as something else. Present it without a clear frame of reference like a, we would like you're reading it in a magazine and I, one of the reasons why I do that is because I want I'm trying to get people to empathize with the image without it being framed in a way that makes it so makes it palatable I don't want my and, and it's slightly self-harming ironically to do that but I I don't want my I don't I, I don't want to make the frames of reference when you're looking at the picture so comfortable it's just like seeing another article in a newspaper or a magazine i'm trying to um create this so i, I might not use their name it might just be something really bland like untitled or a frame number or something so you don't have the context of what you're looking at yeah yeah or a lot of a uh, man with dog i noticed a lot yes. of your projects are man with dog or man in front of yeah. so and so yeah. well, mother and child which is hugely poignant to me yeah. but people may not necessarily understand that unless they they read any of my incredibly mm. tedious blogs <laughs> well, if we, if we do take it back and give a bit more context, I mean, what, what, where did where did photography start for you? Well, I suppose the 
the first picture I took that I remember taking was when I was uh, probably about eight or nine uh, in, uh, and I was waiting for a train to come by, one of these toy trains to come by to take us to the beach in Portugal. Mm. And I just remember standing there with this camera, waiting for the train to come. And then the train was coming and I took the picture. And then of course the, the film went to the chemist, it was sitting in the camera for months and then he went to the chemist and he came back and I was like, oh, he's come back. So I remember being quite excited about looking for the picture of this train. And I was looking through all the photos and there was no picture of a train in the film and it was really strange. And I kept looking through and there was no, no picture of a train. And then I found this picture of some empty tracks. And of course, I, in my excitement as a seven or eight year old, I pressed the button too early. Yeah. And I'd miss the train. Okay. And weird, weirdly, I have this picture and it's hugely important to me because, because it actually, I think that may have been, I was so disappointed and upset. And I think in hindsight, I realised when I was a teenager, when I was using a camera, when my father introduced, uh, he built a dark room in, in our bathroom. He was very, okay. one of these very practical dads that put boards across the bath yeah. and you plug the, the dark room. Yeah, you dug the old, the old um, projector into the light socket and you built mm -hmm. this perfect thing that would block the light out. And I started experimenting with photography with that. And I went to London once to photograph vagrants in the park. And I was only, you know, 14. And I came back and I, I, had, I was a very lazy teenager and I hadn't marked the bottles up properly. I'm the fixer and developer. So I processed the film and then I didn't reprocess it. And then I pulled the film out and held it up to the light. And I saw the... I saw the pictures for a moment and of course then they fogged in front of my eye and I was devastated, absolutely devastated. And I didn't really realise later that I was devastated because I cared so much. It was mm. so important to me. And so what, what, so... What, what, what drew you to vagrants at such a young age? I think I was always a, I was always a, a boy that, uh, I always, everyone used to think I was clumsy because I'd be the boy that fell in the pool or, okay. um, uh, or, or fell off the brick wall. And it wasn't because I was lazy, it was because I was always pushing my boundaries. And I, I, because I pushed my boundaries, I'd fall in the pond or I'd fall off a wall and hurt myself or I'd go mm. skiing and break my leg or, mm. or stuff like that because I'd see, oh, see how fast I could go or see how high I could go. And I was even a rock climber and I nearly died a few times doing that. It was a really bad sport for someone who doesn't have very clear bound risk bound. <laughs> who isn't um, overly concerned with staying on the wall. <laughs> yeah. So I messed, I imagine, it's an interesting question, no, one, no one's ever asked me that, but I imagine I probably went to London on my own on a train at 14 to take pictures of vagrants because I thought it was viscerally exciting. Yeah, I guess, but I guess the, the, the thing that made me realise that at that point, I suppose, was that I was devastated by failure, mm. devastated by the failure of not capturing these things. And I realised the huge, the huge excitement of, of achieving a picture mm. that is completely in what you want exactly what you're looking for yeah it's yeah. such a rush it's a bipolar relationship and that is only equal and opposite emotionally to the utter devastation and failure of missing a picture that you hate and i'm sure i don't believe any photographer that loves photography knows exactly what i'm talking about and i think even in documentary work i think it's even more you know, i'm even more conscious of that incredible relationship between desperately seeking that moment absolutely addicted to that moment and mm. i'm kind of addicted to that moment still but in portraiture but i try and I, I control the limits of my failure so if you look at my work the space within which all this emotional uh, chaos is happening mm. is controlled but i don't yeah, control yeah. the humanity within it but i do yeah. try and limit, limit the limit i try and limit my failure yeah okay i mean it's quite interesting because the this, this space that you're working up you know they're often in people's homes or people's gardens you know how do you find your you know it's incredibly intimate the, the, the spaces that you're shooting in how do you i mean well, how do you find these people and, and 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 find your way into a position where you're you're standing in front of these people with a camera well what's interesting for me about that is that when i get into someone's home they they assume i'm a guest in their mm. home but they don't realize that once i've they often go off and make a cup of tea while i'm setting up a little scene and then they when they walk back into the scene and in front of the camera with the lights in their own house they, don't, they suddenly realise that they're not in their house anymore. They're in my space that I've created yeah, inside interesting. them. Okay. So, and that's really exciting because suddenly they're like, oh, this is, you know. Um, but I do have a, I love visiting other people. I love being on location. I love exploring other people's lives. Um, but part of that, part of that is quite well doc documented in the sense of I have an adopted psychology because I was adopted as a child. Okay. And um, I've gone quite a lot into that. And there is this, from a very early on in my 20s when I was um, uh, working professionally a lot on location, I was 
and my, my initial love of photography was this opportunity to go in and have a poke about inside other people's lives to see what they were like relative to my experience what it was like to have a you know to be um you know a family that's you know biologically together or whatever sure. um or just to explore um uh someone said i was a bit like tiny tim looking <laughs> through the window which I thought was a bit tragic, but also quite a nice metaphor for the yeah. camera being this way of me, excuse for me to visit other people's lives. Um, and a lot of the work that I was creating early on, I didn't show the best of it. I didn't come out as the photographer I was. I just had this huge building archive of work that was my favourite that I wasn't sharing. And I'm still a little cautious about sharing my best work. Very mm. strange. So it's a bit like Vivian Mayer's Garage. Well, I saw I saw this on your on your blog recently. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, again, it was just like it was literally. I mean, the internet, even if it's posted, can feel like Vivian Mayer's garage because there's yeah. no, no no one's actually fucking looking, mate. Potentially yeah. <laughs> no one's reading or looking at it. But um, yeah. So there was this huge archive. And at, at this point, this is, takes me back to this idea of coming coming out and and showing this work before rather than just dropping dead and someone else finding it or it being lost. Yeah. I thought I should at least see how it goes i suppose there's an insecurity in in that the fear of, of of how it would be received but not in the creation of the work the creation of the work I'm, I'm hugely confident with the camera but i think in the sharing of the work i probably have less confidence hmm. in how people are going to receive it i'm I a see. little shy of that I think yeah, yeah, yeah that's where my introversion is i think yeah which, well if if if, if the if there's a lot of the early stuff you were shooting you know, was kind of being put aside and, and you weren't showing it. What was the point at which you transitioned into making a, making a career out of it? It was so seamless because whenever I, whenever I went to see anybody to get work, I got work. So um, I suppose I'm hugely privileged in that. It makes, makes you a terrible mentor if, mm. if you <laughs> always get work and you've never had to try very hard to get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because <laughs> What advice would you give? Oh, go and ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's, it's terrible to, uh, and I think I'm resistant to success, strangely, because of mm. that. It, I, and I, I'm, I've been spoiled by it. Um, but I, on, I started working as an assistant, and then I immediately, when I was in my 20s, I was shooting for um, uh, the Sunday supplement magazines and being sent all over the world in my early 20s. Okay. And then I thought I'd try some advertising, and I got an agent. Right. And then I thought I'd do that for a while, and then I made some money, and I did some advertising, and then you know, I started to develop a fine art practice and I thought I'd get another agent and I got another agent. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I thought I'd go and see, you know, like I said before, I thought I'd go and see Vanity Fair. And, and I, when I went to see Vanity Fair, I, um, they, had, um, they had a screenshot of their editor on the phones and they'd retouched their, without them knowing it was me, they'd had one of my photographs and they'd retouched the editor's face onto one of my photographs and it was a screenshot in the whole office of Vanity Fair. Wow, and okay. I, I walked in there and I was like, that's my photograph. And they all thought it was hysterical. And that was the beginning of that relationship. And I worked with them for years. Okay. So, the, yeah. I don't, it's, again, I'm not really in control of whether or not someone likes me or not. I've had years where I've done less well. Mm. And commercially, I probably, I'm not so chaotically busy. I'm not working in advertising anymore, for instance. Um, I don't have a relationship. I have a difficult relationship with advertising. I don't know if you've spoken to other advertising photographers, but there's a there's a limit to how much you can bear it. Even though mm. the money's very good, um, there are times when you have to take little breaks on and off. So I have a bit of a sort of strange career tra trajectory, certainly commercially, where I'm doing quite well and making a lot of money, and then I'll suddenly just self destruct and withdraw and go and do a residency in Ukraine for two months, <laughs> and then yeah. go and do something really interesting for me. Yeah, and then yeah. Go skin. I need to. I need to make some okay. money. So that that's how you that's how you strike that balance. It's kind of the the commercial stuff is purely funding the personal. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, almost entirely. I would say, in the very nicest possible way, and I mean this very nicely. It's a bit like prostitution, but my clients are all quite nice looking. They're not. You know, I'm, I don't feel like I'm being abused by. Mm. You know, I haven't got really ugly clients, but um, there is. Um, but there are some. Increase more so now the clients I'm working with, like the, the the female prisoners project, and I work on the wreath lectures for instance every year, and they always come back to me for that. It's my regular gig, and it's really exciting. And the client loves that relationship, and I really enjoy the the, the challenge of getting that portrait every year with them. So um, it's not entirely cynical and trans and shallow. 
Yeah. Okay. And and you, you mentioned the the women's prison project, and you know, there's a couple of other examples inside you know various mental health institutions. How, how do you find yourself in, invited into these these you know incredibly well, intimate spaces? A lot of the apart from uh, there's a, there's a project I'm doing at Swansea at the moment, which is clearly on hold. Mm. Um, with working with the university where the university invited me in to do some tutorials and, and some lectures. And uh, there's a gallery um, in Swansea, which is connected to the university. So I, the gallery said, do you want to show? Mm. And I said, yeah, that would be good. So why don't I shoot some new work? So, and then there's the university is supporting me, the creation of the new work, and I'm using students in the creation of that new work that we're going to show. Okay. So, I'm always creating my own residency out of that single opportunity to go and talk to those students. Mm. So it's just like, oh, why don't we do this? Why don't we do this? And why, you know, it's become more the, again, it's the context and the narrative has been slightly shifted with the female prisoners project because the female prisoners project was a commission. Okay. Um, but within that is a lot of issue around self harm. But I didn't know that when we got there, but I ended up creating that personal project out of that commission. So the access, was through some amazing people and producers and people who managed to organize the access. Mm. But then I've created a sort of project within a project. And I do that a lot. I often will be doing something for a client and then I'm very much distracted by a shiny thing. <laughs> and I'll go off and do that and get very excited about that whilst I'm producing this thing for the client. But mostly, hopefully I'm left alone to do that. But the, but if I, I'm suddenly working with people in self harm because they completely felt that I empathized with what they were going through and wanted to experience and express it. And I have no fear of approaching somebody who's um, suffering and, and uh, suffering with the emotions that lead to self-harm mm. to, um, to ask them if they want to um, uh, do anything with, with the camera yeah, to, okay. to communicate that to other people. Mm. And actually um, people desperately want to be understood about the, about the terrible emotional consequences uh, of their thoughts that lead to self-harm as is distraction. Um, and I understand, I know about that. Um, as you say, I think it's reasonably well known that I've been a Samaritan volunteer for 16 years uh, and actually without, without a break. And whilst I'm not qualified as a psychotherapist. You've got I've, a lot of experience in, in. I've got 16 years of yeah. person-centered listening, empathy, and hopefully some of that is stuck. And hopefully, I don't think you should say you're an empathic person. It's up to someone else to say you are. But I think, it, interestingly, that experience as a Samaritan, and my experience as a photographer, they used to be very separate. Slowly over the years, the two have now become very intertwined. Hmm, I can imagine, and, yeah. And, and I, can't escape, uh, I can't escape what... Uh, I've learned from the experience of supporting people in emotional difficulty at Samaritans and that ability to bring that safe space vessel that I mm. can do um, clearly is something which can be used in my photography practice now. Mm. So a client will call up and say, who can we send to um, photograph uh, three, three children whose father died last week? I mean, they're going to send me because, number one, it's not what you say, it's what you don't say. And I think partly they're sending me, I went to photograph somebody recently um, whose son killed himself as a consequence of the, um, uh, the drug lines, the county lines drug running, and he killed okay. himself. And he was literally weeks away from, from the moment. And, uh, and he, she was very cautious about receiving a photographer, but there are some times when you can use that knowledge and that I will, they will say to me, can we tell, can we tell her that you're a Samaritan? Because mm. I think that will be something that she'll need. To feel comfortable. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, and then once you, once you have that knowledge and she feels like you're coming from a space, then you, you, you end up being in a space where the, there's a collaboration between you and that person much more openly. I'm not shy about saying, okay, well try lying on the grass or, um, I don't know, try closing your eyes or, or she could just be sitting there and becoming emotional as she's sharing something. But these aren't opportunities necessarily for verbal therapy. Actually, the, mostly it's a, a quiet space that they sit in with me. Interesting. So 
And in the same way as I create complex and difficult environments for some people, silence can be used in a way to make something um, difficult for a sitter, but mm. it also can be a very peaceful, restful space for, for other people, depending on what they're going through in that moment. But this does lead me on to the idea that I see photography now as a huge potential, and I'm not there yet, but there's so much more potential to push this further and for me to move towards using the, the, the camera as a therapeutic tool more. And I, I hope that um, I can find a way to do some potentially some um, more proper education to get qualified and potentially use the camera because I've seen the value of the camera to people. Whereas before I was only really interested in objectifying and, and, and observing people through the camera for my own needs. But now if, I, if I'm photographing someone with trans uh, uh, dysmorphia issues, dysphoria, trans, you know, transgender or um, uh, issues around gender, if someone is trying to pass as a different gender, photographing them is a really um, uh, exciting experience because it's difficult for them to see themselves in a camera because it objectifies them. And then they could be sometimes very disappointed with how they look and that can be quite scary for them. So okay. you spend more time sitting with them on a bench, looking at each picture with them on the back of the camera and discussing how they feel about what they look like. Mm -hmm. Because actually, but, but, uh, being comfortable as a transgender person is about being able to pass as the gender you want. And sometimes the camera can can rather uncomfortably show that that they feel like they're not. They become very fixated potentially on their Adam's apple, for instance. Right. Okay. Um, and the camera get, offers an opportunity for that to be held and for it to be discussed. And I, I find that really exciting. Uh, and that that's where the the Samaritan part of me. And my, my, um, the photographer, the, the very ordinary photographer, came from, and those those two things are now very much connected. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And you you, you mentioned that prior to that, uh, you know, it was more for your own, you know, the, uh, what you were going in there was, was for your own gain. You know, what 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 was that? Well, do, I think do you have I, a do you have an awareness of what that was? Yeah, I do. I think yeah. it was very much about being an uh, an opportunity to. Um, engage with other people and like i said before to see how other people lived yeah yeah looking through I the window very much, yeah. I, weirdly i did feel on the outside of that but i don't feel like that anymore mm. but I, now it helps me to understand what other people because a lot of people feel dislocated from the world but they don't have the wonderful excuse of being adopted that i yeah have. yeah well i, was, I mean what, at what point did you start kind of specifically confronting that as a you know a, that being your kind of foundation really, in Ukraine, in the residency in Ukraine, I did a project called, um, I didn't even name it, I just went out and I was photographing young mothers. There's a lot of Ukraine um, mothers are quite young and, mm. they're, and uh, they're at home and their uh, partner's quite young, they've gone off to work and in, in Donetsk where I was, which is now a war zone, mm -hmm. um, they were all going off down the mines or whatever, there's coal mines and everything and there's work for these boys. And, but the, the girls were at home with their young children. So I started going around uh, all these fascinating interiors. I don't know if you've seen the mother and child project, yeah, but they're yeah. wonderful sort of Eastern European interiors. Um, and I started photographing these mothers and children. And then during that process, I just started playing with them and um, changing where they were and separating the mothers from the children within the room. And I started to play around and take, taking the mothers out of the frame completely, like the railway on, like the train on the railway track sure. on the outside of the frame. And I'd have them on the outside of the frame and the baby would just be lying on the bed. And I wanted to see where it was, even within a safe environment like a living room, when that baby would start to feel, when you're looking at the photograph, when that would feel wrong to, to, to leave a baby alone yeah. in a still moment. Because a still moment's a frozen moment in time. So yeah, clearly someone could easily just come in mm. and get the baby. But you step out of the frame and then you photograph a baby in a huge empty room. There's something disturbing about mm. that and uncomfortable about that and i felt like there was something there was a part of me that felt like i was crossing a very dangerous boundary um and i didn't know why but i thought i'd play with it and then i started bringing in the mother by bringing just her hand in so that i would show that the mother was present but kind of absent and separated 
from the baby. I mean, yeah, you can yeah. make it up. I mean, it was just ridiculously, uh, uh, and I had no idea in the moment that I was, uh, I was working on a, a very autobiographical profound foundation <laughs> of yourself yeah wow. i was i was in, in a sort of a nervous breakdown during the ukraine phase so i'd split up from a partner of 12 years and i was in a very strange space and ukraine kind of saved me be, by being able to go into this fantastically uh, supportive environment to create work mm. and ukraine kind of embraced me and i was able just to play in, with this country and it ended up being a very autobiographical experience but using the environment and this is this is how i think i've kind of like become quite obsessed by this idea of the photographer um being the most interesting part of a picture um and of course the realization the hysterical realization that this was uh, um uh, um a very autobiographical very personal uh, relationship about um a mother being present and absent and without and what's lovely about that is the genuineness of it, because I didn't go, oh, I'm going to do a project about adoption. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it just, it just emerged. Yeah. And I think, I think that's what happens with me. I think my best work comes when I have no idea what I'm doing. Absolutely no real idea. I'm just going with what I'm feeling in the present. And often it's about feeling there's a boundary I, I shouldn't cross. Mm. There is an uncomfortable edge to a lot it of, has a to lot feel, of work. I think it yeah. has to feel uncomfortable. And I would say if, I was advising or mentoring somebody to see where that line is in yourself yeah. and, and just dip your toe over that line to see what it feels like. Because actually it's only dangerous to you often. It's not really dangerous. It just feels emotionally dangerous, but it's mm. not. Do you, do you, very interesting. Yeah. Do, do you, it's where do all you the good work is actually, I would say that. I think all the best work is when you take a risk. Are you as uncomfortable as, as the scene suggests in a lot of that you know is it is it is that a, a challenge that you're taking upon yourself yeah. to kind of put yourself in the in, yeah, in a vulnerable yeah. position yourself yeah no I, i'm quite conflicted and uh and i just felt uh yeah i felt very uncomfortable about it and i, I didn't uh, i just thought god this is this is quite strangely awkward but i, I tend to have to push myself over mm. the line mm. and that's what the, cam the camera helps me to do that in fact it's the only environment within which i can do it safely so I'm not walking along that high wall anymore or going rock climbing or um, swimming out too deeply into the ocean to see mm. what will happen, sure. see how far I can get. And the camera gives me that opportunity to, to see where that line is. Okay. And I am doing that. So it's quite, so it is quite playful. I'm, I'm seeing, seeing how far I can play. So uh, there was a, I've got a, I've got a large archival file uh, of, of images that I call just for fun, and and it's it's it's, it's the acknowledgement that actually it's not the content of the work that's important; it's the the process <laughs> of getting it. So what you're doing when you're looking at the work is is seeing me, you know, nudging over that line. And yeah, I, okay. again, we like might wanting to offer unsolicited advice to photographers but who who may be struggling with that. There's there's, there's nothing interesting in there's not a huge amount of interest in playing safe. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, in, in talking about process, I, I touched on it at the beginning, but a lot of your work is very, very intimate in people's homes. And how do you find your way, you know, how do you find these people in a lot of the, in a lot of the projects that, 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 that you published? You know, well, they, 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 it's very ordinary, ordinary lives, ordinary people. And I mean, there's a, there's a very diverse range. I think you've been pretty prolific. Well, ordinariness is an interesting out. subject in itself, but yes, yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, um, but, but then find it, finding these these subjects, you know, whether it's a, a family or a, or or, or a, a, a man and his dog, you know, there's no suggestion of um, necessarily of how you've how you've built this. No, no, I wouldn't. Them. No, I don't share that narrative. That's part of me separating that narrative. I've always been asked to do it. So most of the work has come from a huge amount of the work has been redefined as personal from original commissions or pictures okay. that no one's ever okay. wanted. I so see. again, ironically, uh, ironically, pictures that I often will love aren't necessarily the pictures that other people want. Okay. So you end up with, you know, any photographer will know you end up with this huge edit. And, and I think part of my personal process of creating this sort of little personal Vivian Mayer's, Mayer's garage of work mm. was that I think, I was forced to create a personal relationship to work and a fine art practice because consistently the work I thought was the most interesting wasn't being selected. 
Okay. Even though I was always being commissioned, the choice by the art director or the creative director or the picture editor was very much in their hands. I've never, I've never forced an image on somebody. So I think I've ended up, it, it, it's ended up being a lot of personal work that's been created whilst I've been going to do something for somebody else. Okay, that's interesting. So um, I was, I was just uh, I was just about to start posting my gay couples from 2001 2002 because the the gallery that first published those first showed those images in 2002 is um, currently uh, crowdfunding because it's under threat and I thought oh this is great because this gallery put this work up and it it managed to get it got into the observer and it's it's shown in countries where there aren't any equal rights civil rights since and it showed it take modern and uh, it was a, this fantastic sort of document and archive of a state of a period in British life um, of all these gay couples and they were all in their homes and of course the lovely thing is that uh, the, the, I got permission to photograph those people by approaching the Greater London Authority and I just said to them look can I can we get access to these people and it was quite private at the time because there was still people were getting threatened and mm. um, uh, because for coming out at that time, even then, um, but we managed to get um, uh, they they just sent me couples, and I would call them up and i 'd go around to their houses and I would usually go on a recce first, and they would usually come to the door in their dressing gown or in their slippers or whatever, and then I would go in and have a look around and say, "Look, can I come back on Wednesday or whatever and I said, just don 't change, keep the slippers on you know it 's great but it, what was wonderful about the gay project, about gay couples, was what I was trying to do was, was to express something politically very dangerous at the time, which was the ordinariness of gay people's lives. How utterly mundane, um, as, as mundane as everybody else's lives, mm -hmm. these people were. So it was all about the cat and the, you know, the, the, the washing up that hasn't been done in the sink. The, sl the, the slippers. <laughs> you know, um, and the dogs and... Uh, you know, people just standing there and, and it, the, what was lovely about it was not celebrating gay people as some extraordinary uh, group of people, but this, this clearly a perfectly ordinary expectation to have yeah. the same rights as other people. And, I, yeah. and that, that played really nicely into my style because I am really interested in the, the minutiae, the objects that are behind you. I'm looking at you now and I can yeah. see the few objects behind you which represent i'm very interested in the little landscape on the wall and mm -hmm. very un, that, that's clearly important to you and so i there's a lot of it's it's basically that was based on the arnold feeney marriage and if you look at my work a lot of my work has a is formed around the uh, around this idea of of art historical document and objects mm -hmm. so if you look back hopefully it's a bit like the third planet the apes film I think where the world's destroyed by um, by nuclear holocaust, and there's like a group of people living in a bunker. Yeah. And the I can't, I can't say I made it that far into the saga. But. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not worth it. Yeah. But they they find anyone who knows this knows that they find this like one videotape that represents, and that's their only reference to history that they've got. Right. Yeah. They put it on, and it's just like that's all they know about life prior to. And I suppose in terms of legacy, you look back at a picture of. Um, and, and you think, well, what's, what's going to survive historically in a hundred years time, like the Arnold Feeney marriage. And you've got yeah. this picture of some fruit on a windowsill that, that, you know, and, uh, and this strange dress and these funny slippers. And, um, I, I kind of wanted this to be sort of a document of, of ordinary gay people's lives that potentially would be something that people would look back onto. And if, and, and again, detached from context, it's quite interesting when you do, if that's all the information you've got, um, I, I'm interested in that as legacy, I suppose. And that, that, that project has gone into the archive of the London School of Economics. So that's, that's like, that is a little bit like, um, I love it. I love it. Yeah, when my work goes. That's brilliant. That's, uh, I mean, what, what I was going to ask at some point, you know, in relation to the commercial work, you know, do you have a, do you get the same satisfaction from a, uh, a celebrity portrait being printed in a magazine as you do to your work being put into a into a into a university archive or, um, it, or well, being no, exhibited legacy, on the wall or well no that's very different so i mean somebody uh i i get more so i get more satisfaction now because I, because i've been published so much i tend to have a rather 
laissez-faire attitude towards that, which is very foolish. Um, but um, I do, I don't crave being published in a magazine. I don't find that exciting anymore. Mm-hmm. People will say, oh, we won't pay you, but we can give you a credit. That doesn't, that doesn't excite me, especially if they're not using the picture that I really that you, love. That you, that you liked, yeah. But that's true also in terms of potentially uh, exhibiting at the National Portrait Gallery or something like that. If you enter a picture for the Taylor Wessing Portrait Prize and it's a picture you want to, you enter because you want to be on the wall, but it's not your favourite picture. There's a danger of hubris there because you end up with a picture you don't even like on the wall for a couple of months just because you want the uh, bucket list being or... shown. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's a huge mistake. I am interested in the legacy of having stuff in permanent archives that does kind of excite me in a weird way because you feel like a, there's a draw with the um my yours, is, yours, yours, is, yours is the videotape that's going to be found and yeah uh, yeah i kind of like i love that idea of some archive being part of some archive future archive i quite like that and hillary mantel i sent hillary mantel a picture of her swirling around in her red cape because i was just so in love with it i, I loved it so much and it was such a wonderful expression of her because people because she's quite frail and a little overweight I think people were sort of afraid to ask her to do anything. Right, okay. And Because uh, there's no pictures of her previously where she was just enjoying herself. She was mm. rather static. And so I sent her a print and I, I just, and uh, she said, oh, this is lovely. And she said, I'm going to put it into my archive. And she said, uh, she said, it's, um, it's earthquake proof in California. <laughs> and I got very excited that it, it was like, you know. <laughs> it That's was fantastic, expected. yeah. So I do like the, I do like the idea of the gay, the gay couples being in an archive. Um, uh, again, there are some pictures that I think the National Portrait Gallery would accept into their archive of mine, but I don't think they represent me. They only represent the subject. Okay. Fairly. So I'm a little cautious about what pictures, um, you know, I'm a little cautious about what pictures uh, I let out and, how, you know, how they're seen. So being published is is okay if it's a picture i love um exhibiting is great i i again my the introvert in me uh finds that uh, tricky my relationship to exhibiting is quite tough i usually get very self-critical of, of work when it's showing but i love to show show the work and and i love that relationship of the gallery space and forcing uh you to empathize with me mm-hmm. and my my process the gallery makes is an invitation to um empathize with the artist and be enveloped in their mindset. That's a wonderful thing. I love that. Um, But photography is very difficult to show on a wall, I think, in the same way as a painting. I often think you have to be dead to show a photograph really well. Okay. (laughs) It's like, you know, I think photography tries to compete with the art world and I don't think it's a level playing field. I don't think necessarily photography always exhibits at its best on a gallery wall. Ironically, it looks very good online, but there's so much of it. But yeah, so um, I think, you know, photography looks amazing on a computer, but then you've got to deal with all the democracy and all the sort of masses of content that's being created. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's interesting that we, we do try and compete with the, with the art world, uh, as in the painting fine art, art world on the same, level and i don't i think that's a mistake uh, well, what, what what is it about photography that you don't think lives as well in that in that context well it, i mean it does sometimes work but i think it i think it can feel i think it's important to see i do think it's important to see an object a, 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 a photograph through and create it into an object like a print yeah yeah okay. an object of desire yeah that's that someone wants and wants to own so i i completely do uh, get the idea of a limited edition and a print that you can own as a physical object. I mean, interestingly, during this uh, lockdown, that's that that's we're now having to sort of reassess mm. whether whether uh, that really is the most valuable way to see work. But there is, I think, it does make your photography very real, and it changes the nature of the work when you make it into something tangible. And put it on a wall and invite your fellow human beings to come see it. I think then, then you, then it changes the nature of the work. It changes the image almost on a molecular level. It just becomes a different picture the more people look at it. And 
sometimes you can be, it can fail. Um, it could go from something online, which you're very excited about, and then you can bring it onto the wall and just go, oh, it doesn't work. Um, and interesting, and it, that's, that's, again, the introvert in me, and uh, also brings up a discussion about um, how we need an audience for our work. And I'm not saying we shouldn't show in galleries, I'm just saying we, it, it's hard to show photography well in that gallery space, I think, mm. sometimes. And I think uh, even, you know, truly great photographers, um, when they show in a certain way, it can, it can fail, um, interestingly. But I, I love that, I love the way that a picture becomes informed by certainly how famous it is, or the more people exposed to it, suddenly it takes on a life of its own. If you've ever had a picture that um, has done well, yeah. for instance, um, you interest you can sit back and observe it changing its nature. It, it, it almost physically changes its nature from being just another obscure photograph in your archive to a picture which is with significance known, yeah, and yeah. significant to other people. That's that's a metaphor in itself about our relationship to other people. Um, as artists, to, to, so it is important to bring our work into the world. So I do think it is important to do it, but I think it, it's important not to necessarily compete with um, with the fine with fine art in that way. It is difficult. And um, I mean, you've, you've you've talked about the you know the camera as being a vehicle into a particular connection with someone, or a, or a vehicle into a certain space, or or or, or topic, or or what have you. And there's a quote of yours as well, which is um, that you view the world from the outside in attempting to cross the divide with the help of the camera. Yeah. And you know how important is are the tools themselves? You know, is it really just a means to an end? Because you know, in terms of digital resolution and and, and the types of cameras that you choose to shoot with, or your or the lighting that you choose to work with, you know, is it purely functional? No, no, no. There's, no, there's multiple there's multiple elements to it. I love working on the high resolution. Um, uh, well, you know, you know personally that I'm very interested in, in in the huge personal emotional satisfaction of working in high resolution digitally, mm. because I am very interested in existential detail. Mm -hmm. um, I love to be able to um, examine as much as possible. Exactly. Yeah, really, just get right in, almost like stalking somebody. I can photograph somebody, and I can come back to the screen and. And I could just, ex often if they're naked as well, and I'm, I'm just examining them, their body in no way I could do that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I can just like, I can just look at every, every sort of pore of someone's face. And that existentially is really interesting to me, that sort of mortal mm. examination of people and, and space. And, and also a lot of my pictures um, have a lot of space around them with detail in them, which yeah. requires a high resolution. So, when you come to print something up quite big, for instance, like the uh, autistic boys in flowers, for instance, I mean, they were two and a half meter light boxes. Okay. So um, the, they have to be absolute, everything has to be for me um, sharp and, and entirely, the, the, the clarity has to have an emotional resonance in itself. I love clarity. The pictures of the boys in the flowers in Ukraine um, shot on a high resolution with the flash, which also helps with resolution, with this yeah. fantastic detail that I can get technically, with a flash combined with a high resolution camera. The, the, I was photographing this boy running through some flowers, fl a, a rose bed in this park, and you don't even know what you're getting mm. in the moment because it's, there was bright sunlight and I was underexposing and just filling the whole space with flash. Yeah, yeah. And it's only when I got back to the computer and I started to sort of open up Photoshop and start pulling in to two, 300% and start looking around at things. And, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a grasshopper sitting on a, on a leaf behind him, almost like God's CCTV watching. <laughs> and, it, and it was almost like a metaphor for autism, that yeah. excruciating level of detail that's so disabling. Maybe I should start titling these and call this one God's CCTV. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I was so completely fascinated by, by the fact that, uh, that some things can appear after you photograph them, not only conceptually, but also literally. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then also another one of those boys, they, they don't respond to the camera in people, children anyway, but children with autism, with extreme autism, 
you can't tell them to stand anywhere. They do not have a spatial awareness that, 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 that recognizes you standing there with the camera and asking them to stay still. So we're just photographing this boy who's just flashing the flashes onto him as he's sort of moving and flailing around in this space, not knowing what I was getting and just thinking that this boy has no sensory connection to the world whatsoever. Okay. And when I got back to the computer to upload the pictures and process the rules, I was looking at this one image and I looked, I looked at his hand and his hand is holding the bud of a rose and right. it's entirely connected yeah, yeah. in a way that, that no one understood or could understand. And again, that was a fantastic metaphor for autism, which is so, so misunderstood and so, so easy to misdiagnose and be understood. And that, that picture won the Art Laguna Prize uh, in the Venice, BNR, BNR, uh, Venice Arsenale in 2000. 13 and that was an amazing moment for me because yeah, it was yeah. such an important picture and that was when a picture that i did like get got selected yeah. that was very rare for a picture that i truly loved got selected and i didn't know i'd won it which was really interesting so i was a complete mess when when that was announced i had no idea but um again they they seem to recognize the value of that and that was a really important for me in terms of i suppose you could move on to talking about winning awards um and we can all be cynical and say it's not important but actually, I think it really helps. It's helped me in my confidence to know occasionally that my peers have recognised what I'm doing. When often, sometimes you feel like you're rather alone. So it, it does that. That did help me with my confidence that that someone out there did feel that there was value in that picture. I mean, yeah, yeah. beyond beyond the people in the residency who loved it, and they created this vast exhibition of two and a half metre light boxes in this old Ukrainian factory to show this work and. That the, there were the, a lot of the Ukrainian audience were crying during that exhibition, and I suppose going back to this question about what satisfies you most, a single a single person's response to to your image like that is 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 more valuable than two hundred thousand people seeing it in the Telegraph magazine, much as I buy the Telegraph magazine. Yeah. And, and <laughs> so um, yeah, no, I mean that, that that was something I was going to ask about the you know the the the, the winning of awards or being selected as part of as part of competitions yeah that yeah yeah i mean that that must be um having never experienced myself that must be you know a pretty unparalleled sense of uh, appreciation for the work that you're doing and how 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 important uh well you've just said that they're you know they're very important but you, you know do you enter a lot of competitions i do put some still? stuff in. Yeah. i'm careful yeah i'm careful what i enter mm. i have this really amazing project at the moment which again very ironically, like Vivian Mayer's garage, I can't show. Mm. It's a private commission by um, the um, uh, CEO of um, Channel 4. Okay. And she asked me, she was really interested in my work, and she asked me to photograph her family. Okay. And I did, I've done the most extraordinarily beautiful pictures of her children. And she assisted me on it, but I can't show them. Um, and I'm, there's a really lovely project, there's a really lovely uh, deadline approaching, which may not be helpful for the podcast depending on the, on the on the history on the timeline that you're putting it out there but the Helsinki festival is offering um uh, inviting contributions for, and the themes trust and it would be perfect for that but it's just um I'm just negotiating with her whether or not her and I also have to negotiate with her children to make sure they're comfortable because you if it does well you lose control of it right yeah so you have to be careful success can be um mm -hmm. a problem so um most of the time the Success in competition, uh, it's less of a celebration. It's more like a relief because um, I think we all have very high expectations and all love our own work. And it's usually a sort of disappointment that someone else is not recognising it. Mm. I'm sure we all feel like that. So actually, it's more like a fucking relief uh, that someone's it's, actually... It was worth it. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm very cautious about, for instance, I'm very cautious about the work that I consider my most important. I, I don't just like spread thinly like a cheap mar margarine around. I very, it's very precious to me. But the Art Laguna Prize, I, I, I thought was worth it. And I put it in for that. And, uh, but weirdly, I've, uh, but another problem with me is that I tend to hang on to a lot of work for quite a long time before I decide to do something with it. Okay. And, and that, unfortunately, a lot of competitions have deadlines, which I miss because I'm not ready to show it. You haven't well, I haven't that box no, no, exactly. And I do rather, I do rather, um, uh, I'm rather possessive about 
my best work in a very unhelpful way to my career um, because it's almost like there may be insecurity in that in the same way of sharing it might burst that bubble of, of deep love I have for certain work but but also it is just it's so precious to me. Yeah, yeah. the autistic voice is, is such an important project yeah and you touched on it at the beginning as well you know is it, is it do you like being able to revisit it do you like kind of being able to put it aside for a period of time to be able to go back and you you know you talked about pictures changing over time oh absolutely and kind of revisiting it and taking on a, a new level of meaning yeah well that's what that's the joy of our arch archiving and i think now interestingly i think whilst we're all locked down and we can't do any photography um or very little photography um now is an amazing opportunity to do what i do all the time which is basically I and mean, i've got like one two three four five I've got six two terabyte hard drives in front of me now, mm. um, two laptops and another 12 hard drives, old archival hard drives up there, plus um, about 16 boxes of, of, uh, of DVDs from when I used to burn my pictures onto DVDs, yeah. which I still have to go through individually when I'm desperately trying. I'm trying to find a picture of this guy with a, a butterfly net. Okay. And it's driving me absolutely mad because I, I can't find the file number because digitally it's great. You can just put the file number in, plug it in your hard drive, and then it finds every file number that's 1642. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love that. And I'm also quite excited by the randomness of that. I was going to say, is, is, you know, how, how is that organized? Is it really just a case of digging through these boxes and drives and, yeah. and seeing what's in there? Yeah, because a lot of it's digital now, thank goodness. Um, my film career, uh, clearly I'd scanned in quite a lot of stuff, but I've also got a lot of film which isn't scanned. Um, but when I moved, made the transition over to digital, which was very easy for me because I used to shoot transparency, mm -hmm. you had to get absolutely right. So when I moved to digital, it was pretty much the same. So I didn't struggle. But um, yeah, now I can literally just, I don't have to be too organized. All I have to do is enter the file number and plug in the hard drive until I find the file number and it pops up, the raw pops up or, yeah, yeah. or you know, but it's not that well organized because at the moment there's two pictures I can't find. It's driving me stark raving mad. I don't think that was a question you asked me, but um, well, um, no, I mean it, it does answer the question of, um, of yeah, and, yeah. And, and and what kind of order that's in. Yeah. Oh, it did, yeah, I mean it's chaos, but it's sort of organised chaos. But there is a very important element, which is about reframing narrative, reframing the context of work. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, I just posted um, uh, something on. I just bung, bung something up. Uh, I think an, an incubator, I think it was. And it's a, it's a nice picture. It's a great picture of an incubator. But I just felt, you know, depending on the epoch that you're in, your work can take on a whole new meaning, which is an argument for never, ever throwing anything away, no matter how shit you think it is. Mm. And I've thrown away a lot of images, thousands and thousands of images. Um, because I was just thinking, this is never going to be valuable. And that's such a mistake because... Uh, you have no idea what, uh, how society is going to change to suddenly make that work valuable. I think my early career, because I'm old enough to have, a, have a, a, to have a commercial career where I was creating quite trite work, which I was deeply embarrassed by. But then 2000, the, the, the millennium came along and then Wolfgang Tillmans came along. <laughs> and then, of course, suddenly everything was up for grabs. Tillman's just set us all free, you know, and I was like, fuck. And then I started digging into this archive and I had these pictures of this terrible quiz show host called Leslie Crowther. And you wouldn't remember him, you're too young, but he was just this awful TV show. So she used to pronounce the prices right. And this was sort of early career stuff that I had that I should have thought, oh God, I should have thrown that away. And these really yeah. terrible, cheesy poses. Yeah. And of course, then I made him the sort of host of this exhibition. And uh, I created a whole new portfolio of, of Leslie, what Leslie Crowther would, would be the curator of. And I curated a whole show around Leslie Crowther. And then I got an agent through that. And then I started shooting the advertising world, loved it. And I just right. got tons of work. Never, never, never throw anything away. Yeah, I got stuff for all these like, you know, Nintendo, Tango, Virgin, all just loved this sort of super kind of cheesy irony. And that was just reinventing, just reinventing the book. Mm. It just went mad. And that's when I did my best in advertising. That's when I made most of my money. When, yeah, I, right. when I did that from this silly, really cheesy archive. It was just, so what you could do is choose, you know, you choose a host for some work and use them as inspiration, create work around it. And it was just <laughs> a really odd work, like a, like a 
uh, there was a golf course I went to in the south of France. I was in a helicopter, and the, it was a, it was themed and it was a sexually themed golf course. Bizarre, so, it, yeah, so the bit is like a par three was this erect penis, and you and you 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 teed off. He peed off the, off the testicle, <laughs> and and the uh, and the the, um, the flag was on the bell end of the <laughs> the, uh, the thing photographing from the thing. And of course, I, it was just a shoot that I was on with this travel journalist. It was just sitting in the archives, and I just brought that into the Leslie Crowder exhibition. So it's just an opportunity, a huge opportunity, the archive to to play with new set of rules that's being created by mm-hmm. by the society you're around. So Jesus Christ, I mean. There's some stuff where I do slightly worry about legacy, about what people might find, you know. Yeah, but yeah, you might yeah. be you might be throwing away some really valuable shit. Sure. Well, and I mean, of course, it's... yeah. Of course, the other thing is that I threw a lot of film away, mm. and it was before the found photography movement. And of course, now I wish I'd just left it in like scattered all over the city. At least found photographers could actually enjoy it. Yeah. You know, who were working in that found photography artists could enjoy. It. And I did go through a phase. During the when the found photography movement started, I did still have a lot of work that I didn't particularly want, and I started going around London, leaving transparencies in different places over London. I did do that for a while as a sort of gift to 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 anybody that might be excited about finding a photograph in the street because it's quite mm-hmm. exciting. You... Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I've never I've never looked into it, but I've never done the found photography thing. But uh, yeah, so if you don't if you, if you do don't throw it away, you scatter your archive to the winds. Yeah, just leave it, leave it there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just throw it off the balcony. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm super uh, excited by archive. I'm super yeah. super excited by the the possibilities of archive. Hmm. I mean, I'm interested because what you've described there is quite a, you know, spontaneous. You know, pick up this drive and see see what's hidden within it. Is that also? And you you, you have touched on it a bit with the. Uh, um with the the boy holding on to the rose while you burst burst shots off trying to you know trying yeah. to piece something together and do you always kind of work in quite a spontaneous way or does it depend on the situation there's some situations where you'll try and control things a bit more or do you kind of no, it's never get your lining in place and there's a starting point which is linear like i'm going into work to do this or i'm going to photograph this but it's exactly the same process i described earlier mm. about being distracted mm. so um i'll go in to for instance, to find um, the man with the butterfly net, for instance, mm. and just get horrifically distracted. Um, and I'll suddenly, while I'm looking for man with butterfly net, which is file 1343, I'll find a dog with a muzzle on it yeah. at, at 1643, and then just be fascinated by that and then start working on that or writing about that, or then that will pull in some other elements to it. And I'll start going down a rabbit hole, which, which is more successful than looking for something which I'm never going to find. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of just being open, I'm open to at least not just seeing a dead end and just going, oh, fuck, I'm still upset. I can't find sure. a man with a butterfly there. But I am kind of making... You'll find it when you're looking for something else sometime. Yeah, I will, almost certainly. Mm. But yeah, I'm kind of in the same way when I'm shooting, I think I'm most unsuccessful when I'm going in a dire- in a single direction. Like this is what I'm this is what I'm going to do. So there has to be an element of accepting and being open to failure, like we spoke about before, risking failure, risking mm. walking along the edge of the pond. Yeah. And and then seeing what happens. But actually it is quite exciting, even if you fall in. Yeah, yeah. So um I think there is an element and I think the camera allows me that. And I think there is an element of which has nothing to do with photography, is about my need for a little hit of adrenaline that, uh, that's required. And I guess the camera is documenting when that happens. So whenever you're looking at a picture that I like, which is on my website, anything I post on my website is something that I'm very excited about. Um, that's usually a moment I'm getting very excited. And interesting that there is no commercial work on your website. Not, not defined as commercial work, even though even though it's probably... There might have been elements that have been picked up on, you yeah. know, when working on a project. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but I don't. There's there's no magazine covers or anything like that. And is it, again, you no. touched on it earlier, but it that doesn't doesn't excite no, you. Or... No, I don't list my clients. Um, mm. I yeah, I don't. I mean, I I I, I don't even keep them actually anymore. Mm. I used to keep them and get them laminated. I got a lot of those, and uh, but I don't even keep them. I don't seem to be that interested in in that. I think. I think it's about, certainly about ego, but I think it's about 
I think is, it, so, is, it, is it anything to do with it not being a body of work? You know, one shot doesn't have, I suppose, the... I mean, it sounds terrible, Albert. It's not enough about me. No, no, I can... <laughs> it's I'll not... take that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a terrible confession. Everyone's going to go, oh, what a twat. But um, uh, at least it's honest. Um, but, I mean, the, you know, it's like... It's not, I'm not doing necessarily a, a story about something and the pictures happen to be by me. It's, uh, I am quite excited if there's a, a project, which because my work's more existential now. It's not, it's not just about female prisoners mm. in prison. It's not a simple straight line narrative. Mm. It's, about, it's about other stuff going on. And I think that, that that's not something that's easily publishable in a, in a straight line where you're talking about... Uh, some of the sort of complex human emotions about being detained and uh, or, or or even just other human emotions which we all share which other people are finding difficult dealing with mental health is a really interesting subject because it's very difficult to define and express in art and certainly in photography it doesn't really i'm trying to i'm trying to explore depression in photography and it's almost it's it's such a difficult thing to define anyway mm. i don't Really well, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, hearing hearing that that you were adopted as, as a child because um, I had a friend who, a couple of years ago, was starting to try and you know put those pieces together in her own life, and it it struck me suddenly like this would be an amazing topic to try and capture. <laughs> I, yeah. I have no idea how you would go about it, but you know, it's what it's it's the kind of subject that you think you understand, you know, because you know the word, but then actually there's so much to, to understand about that that. Yeah, you know, I, I've, I've never, never undertaken it and figured out how that would, that, that would, that would come about. The way I've managed to try and explore what it's about is through clearly an accidental documentation of the world from someone who is adopted, mm. who's been fascinated by other people's lives because he's felt like somehow his, his life isn't complete, and that's a sort of pre-verbal trauma, it's called, where you don't even have that consciousness if that's what you're doing. But clearly photography and other people fascinate me because whilst I've made peace with it now, mm. early in my career, I was just drawn constantly to, to have an excuse to, to explore other people. So mm. it, it's, like, it's like the virus. How do you photograph an invisible enemy? And I think, you know, photography is failing in that at the moment. I haven't seen any photography that's really feels like it's capturing what's going on because everyone's so spread out. Some of the rules, the aesthetic rules that help us to understand something like yeah, the yeah. virus, it's similar to mental health. It's well, there's very often, difficult to know how to do it. Yeah, there, there, there's often a lot of writing alongside your work as well. And you know, do you feel that mm -hmm. there's only so much that the photography can can yeah. kind of distill on the subject that, you, that it has to be something else? Yeah, I'm really excited by this picture of uh, of a chap that I was again accidentally going to photograph in his house, but he happened to be very depressed when I got there. So I actually spent a lot of time with him, just capturing him and working with him. And there's this picture of him inside his house. And he's lit inside the house and outside there's this sort of um, shopping, uh, a washing line that, mm. that leaves, that are joined at the point where his window is, where he's inside. And I'm right back and it's all very underexposed as normal with lots of flash. Mm. And then the, the washing line's just running through the camera all the way up to, all the way out of camera on mm. both sides for absolutely no reason whatsoever. And it's completely, it feels completely wrong for it to be there. And there's no explanation for it to be there. And that's kind of where I am with photography at the moment. I'm interested in this idea of, of representing things which, um, where the narrative is ambivalent and not entirely clear, but in some way it does resonate, it does connect to you, but you don't necessarily... Don't quite know why. Don't quite know why. But that's, that's, your, that's, that's the really interesting side of photography now where it, it, it's a bit like that frustration if you're not doing well as a photographer and you haven't had any success and you... Uh, been used by the success of other photographers you mm. can't understand how so many people are responding to this image that you just don't get i felt like that looking at certain pictures and just gone what is that what is it about that photograph that everyone's getting and well I, I think it's quite interesting on uh, again in your on your in the statement on your website describes what you're trying to capture as personality architecture and i think that yeah. happens with that happens with buildings and architecture as well and maybe i'm i'm making a connection that isn't there but it's the same thing you're like i love this this building or this space, I, I don't quite know why, but it's just, uh, it's an atmosphere or a, or, yeah. or a mood yeah. or a structure or... Uh, Actually, interestingly, I think landscape is the thing I'm probably least good at. I'm terrible at landscape. Mm. Um, and uh, um, I really love looking at other photographers' landscape who do it well. 
because they do manage to bring in that fourth dimension. I think what we're talking about now is what makes a great photograph. And it isn't necessarily the content. It's really the, the space between words. It's often an the element that, yeah, it's something else mm. that's happening mm. that, that, um, that we're not necessarily in control of and that, that, that human beings collectively are responding to potentially. And that's what's interesting, I think, certainly about being successful potentially being very famous i know some people who are very famous photographers and artists who are friends of mine and then again they make terrible mentors because mm. um they don't really know why their, their work's usually successful either I mean, mm. you can't control it it's not something you're in control of mm. I, I was mentored by boris mikhailov in ukraine and he thought he was a terrible mentor and he was like oh i can't do this and he wasn't going to come back and i really needed him to come back to ukraine because he was in berlin i really needed him to come back and I, I spoke to him on the phone. I said, I really, you really need to come back. And he said, no, I'm a terrible mentor, blah, 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 in pidgin English, Russian. And, um, and I was going, no, your very, your very presence, your, knowing that you're coming back is the motivational force for us. Yeah. Please, please, please come back. back. Please come back. Yeah. So um, That's interesting talking about motivation because that was, uh, I suppose, my way of kind of rounding this off and putting it in, in, in a current context. How do you keep yourself motivated thinking about that next idea? And, you know, particularly at this point when we're in lockdown and we don't know when the gates are going to open again, how do you keep yourself motivated for, for future projects? Yeah, I'm, I am concerned about that because I think part of me is still existing like the world's going to go back to normal and I'm just going to wait this out. And I think part of my brain is still functioning like that. I went through a stage last week, which was difficult, where I was feeling quite negative, where I was saying to people, well, I'm fucked. This, I'm a people photographer. What am I going to do? Uh, instead of going, well, what's the opportunity? And I think part of talking to you now, I don't know if you could, I don't know if I was expressing my enthusiasm for engaging in the archive and, no. and I'm redirecting my uh, creative positive thoughts towards other things. Yeah. I've got a still life project that I'm starting this afternoon after I finished with you, because mm. actually that means I'm getting the camera out. Okay. And for the first time in weeks, and I'm actually going to do something. So, and you know, we're not going out to two or three times a week to shoot things to, so we can feel excited about, about that new work. So mm. I think I'm feeling quite, I'm not entirely locked down. So I, I, do, go, I do go off and do my Samaritan shifts because I have my letter so I can travel and go and do that. that that's helping me and motivating me. Um, I've become a little over keen on sharing on social media which is it's been a light at the end of the tunnel Richard <laughs> yeah. yeah and I wouldn't ever do that I think if it weren't it wasn't for this I just wouldn't be constantly posting squirrels uh, on nut feeders on, on social media if, uh, um, but there's a lot of really interesting uh, things happening in photography um, online which I find amazing yeah. so I'm really enjoying sharing that yeah, you want to feel valuable. It's, it's tricky. Yeah. But I'm actually holding a camera this afternoon. And um, yeah, even though there's nowhere for it to go, it feel, feels like the only thing I can do, play around. It's more of a conceptual idea, but okay. it's just like uh, an opportunity to get the camera out, I suppose, put it together, yeah. put a light up. Yeah. Um, and also I think it's, I want to document um, something that's on my mind now, which I think is a good idea that may or may not be, but again, in six months time. It might take I on think, new life. I think potentially... I think I spoke about this on a blog, but I, this idea that conventional photography may not be the most interesting thing about what's happening right now. I think, you know, a lot of people are documenting their lives on their phones that we can't get access to as professional photographers or as artists. We, we can't get out there and do that. So I think curatorially, mm. there's going to be there's a fantastic sort of massive information that's being created at the moment. Definitely, yeah. It's going to be really interesting. And out of that are going to be a couple of really amazing moments that we're not seeing it. Um, but uh, so my auntie was, um, she's in Ashford and uh, in this little cul-de-sac and she sent me a te text saying that they were all going out, all the neighbours were sitting on their own individual front lawns having a glass of wine together. And I was it's like... It's a shame you can't go out and get a picture of that. <laughs> you know, and I said to her, take a photo. Yeah. You know, because it's, uh, it's rather rather lovely scene there. Yeah, it's yeah. very difficult to, to, to photographically express uh, social distancing. I did, I did see something posted yesterday about someone who'd done a, a wet plate portrait of someone through Zoom. Uh, wow. <laughs> and I wow. thought, well, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, pushing, yeah. pushing, pushing the barriers of what's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, someone, someone said that to me yesterday about pressing uh, control command three. Okay. Just talking to people. Yeah. You know, just photographing them on their, 
on the Skype calls. Yeah. That's um, all. It's, it's, it's all we have have at our disposal now. But uh, yeah. yeah, I think there'll be a lot of people engaging in home still life, and uh, and there'll be a lot of pictures of people's gardens uh, that come out of this. I think. I was talking. I'm mentoring a student at the moment, and she was invited in Swansea, and she was invited to a residency in this island just off the Welsh coast, and she's got a child anyway. Mm. So um, she was struggling about being able to go um, because of a baby anyway. This is before the lockdown. Mm. And I was saying, well, why don't you, why don't you uh, create like an avatar mm -hmm. for yourself? So don't go to the residency, but, but ask one of the people or send someone in your place as an avatar mm. and then have them on live, have them on the live feed on the camera. Yeah. And then you just direct them like your avatar yeah. to create the body of work for you. But that's weirdly prescient now. Uh, that would be quite an interesting way to send out avatars to do our work for us because we can't leave the... <laughs> maybe maybe that's the that's the next step well um i think that's a nice place to round off yeah. it's been a pleasure to to sit with you and hear your hear your thoughts yeah my pleasure thanks so much <laughs>